Good evening, everyone. Hope everything is going well by your side. It's 6 p.m. Cairo local time. Hope you're having a nice evening and enjoying joining us for this webinar for tonight. Speaking is Dr. Zahra Ahmad al Mwefi, Assistant Researcher at the Child Health Department at the Medical Research Division of the National Research Center in Egypt. Uh, and uh, the conference unit uh, secretary. I'm really honored and uh, very pleased to be introducing our webinar for tonight. Uh, actually, uh, the series we are starting again with uh, Elsevier under uh, the collaboration with the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. Uh, this is uh, the second series we have been uh, going through. Uh, the first series was entitled Enhance Your Research with Elsevier. This one now uh, starting last Sunday, we started started the new series towards a deeper research impact. We had uh, Mr. Khaled Chalen, a co-research solution consultant at Elsevier, and now uh, area manager at uh, Elsevier in Egypt and Northeast Africa uh, with us last Sunday. And today we will be uh, going through a topic I think um, many researchers are really interested in it. We have uh, subscriptions and submissions for registration in this uh, webinar tonight, uh, not only from researchers at the National Research Center in Egypt, but also uh, from various universities, um, um, research institutes and academies all over Egypt, uh, many countries in Africa, in Europe, in Americas, um, in Middle East, and uh, up to Malaysia and Singapore are joining us tonight. So I think it's um, a really um, interesting topic that had over 500, maybe over 600 uh, registrants for it tonight. Uh, our uh, webinar tonight is entitled uh, Publishing in Line with the Sustainable Development Goals. And our uh, speakers uh, tonight are um, acquisition editors from Elsevier. Um, Mrs. Uh, Natalie Farah. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. I will do my best. And uh, Yura Sunini. I hope I'm telling it right. Uh, and I would like to welcome our panelists um, for tonight. Uh, we have um, Dino Venturino, LCV Reference Solution Sales Manager. Uh, and Melita Perez, she's the customer consultant for the EMLA team. EMLA stands for Emerging Markets uh, in Latin America. And uh, Mr. Khaled uh, Shalen, co-research solution consultant at Elsevier uh, Africa and area manager in Egypt and Northeast Africa. Um, Dr. Uh, Hashem El Enshosi, Director of uh, Institute of Bioproject Development at the University of Technology in Malaysia. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Hiba El Refai, uh, the head of the conference unit at the National Research Center, uh, to just uh, launch the webinar for tonight. Please, Dr. Hiba. Uh, until Dr. Hiba joined us, I would like also to welcome uh, Mr. Walid Ali, EKB trainer, and actually uh, the collaboration with the Egyptian Knowledge Bank uh, is not starting tonight. It's been a while. Uh, we have been organizing at the conference unit at the National Research Center uh, a series of um, webinars uh, in collaboration with the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. And actually, uh, I think we are um, going through a good um, a way in um, giving the researchers the tools they need to perform better. So please, Mr. Walid, if you can uh, talk to us a little bit about the EKB and the collaboration with the National Research Center. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Al-Zara. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I will not uh, take a lot of time uh, today. Um, uh, I will just uh, refer to some uh, of AKB uh, services uh, related to this uh, session. Uh, mainly, uh, if you allow me to uh, share my screen. Sure. Uh, 
I hope it's clear for everyone right now. Yeah, uh, we can see it. Mainly, I'd like to talk about the huge amount of e-resources uh, which uh, um, you have access uh, via AKB. Uh, right now, you have access to more than uh, 30 publishers. Uh, these uh, 30 publishers uh, allowed access to more than uh, 120 uh, database uh, like uh, e-journals, uh, e-books, uh, encyclopedias, uh, some databases uh, in every uh, uh, in all subject area, uh, and uh, the service which uh, related to uh, today's session. Uh, is language editing. Uh, AKB uh, um, offered uh, uh, language editing for uh, all re Egyptian re researchers can uh, get uh, this uh, service for free. Uh, you can um, apply to this service uh, from akb.eg from the home page. You can go to uh, the fourth uh, advertisement. From here, you can go to read more to uh, obtain uh, one uh, free editing uh, for language for any manuscripts. Uh, here you, we can uh, find all the instructions. Uh, after reading, you can submit your manuscript via this link from the home page. And you can uh, write here your email, your email and upload your manuscript and uh, fill all the data uh, related to your manuscript, like uh, the title, uh, the journal uh, you have to uh, submit your manuscript to, uh, your subject area, the journal uh, details. Uh, then you can obtain uh, your manuscript uh, revised by a third party called Inago. Uh, within uh, five days, you can obtain uh, this service. I, I don't uh, don't uh, need to take much more time for uh, AKB to uh, continue uh, your session uh, right now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zahra. Thank you very much, Mr. Walid. We're really glad to have you again tonight and again and again in collaboration with the Egyptian Knowledge Banks and all the services uh, that the Egyptian Knowledge Bank offers for Egyptian researchers in Egypt. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'd and like I'm to here for any questions. Yes, sure. Uh, I'd like to remind our audience that we have a Q&A button and you may write down your questions as soon as they uh, come to your mind and we will be answering all the questions at the end of the session. Uh, please, Professor Heva Erefei, Head of the Conference Unit at the National Research Center. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zahra, our super organizer. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'd like to thank you for your efforts. On behalf of the Vice President of the National Research Center for Research Affairs, Professor Dr. Mandouh Mouawad, I'd like to welcome our great guests in this series of webinars organized by our conference unit in collaboration with Elsevier and the EKB. Entitled Towards Deeper Research Impact, and this webinar will be entitled Publishing in Line with Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Uh, I wish this webinar will be of great value to all attendees also aiming to more cooperation and great outcome for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Heba, for being part of our event tonight and for your continuous support uh, for all of us at the Conference Unit of the National Research Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Khalid Salen, we would like to hear from you again as uh, being uh, uh, our solid partner <laughs> at the Elsevier side. Actually, I feel um, very blessed to be collaborating with you all through the past year. Maybe uh, a COVID-19 outbreak has been a blessing for us to work together uh, virtually, <laughs> but hopefully we can meet very soon. Uh, please, I would like to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 
Dr. Al Zahra and the conference unit for organizing the event here today. It is always a pleasure uh, to have this special relationship and partnership with the NRC conference unit and to have the kind uh, patronage and actual support from the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. Uh, it is a, a quite unique partner that we have, even if we're talking on global uh, sense. Uh, you're talking about 100 million, 100 million uh, population in Egypt that are actually being covered by access to digital resources, including Science Direct, including other solutions from Elsevier. And as Mr. Walid said, 30 other publishers, more than other 30 publishers as well. This amount of content and knowledge being made available, not just to academics and researchers, but even to ordinary citizens as well. That is actually a very unique kind of setup. And uh, one of the key things is that Egyptian Knowledge Bank are always pushing us to actually do more when it comes to trainings, do more when it comes to support, do more when it comes to uh, coming up with new topics, uh, with tackling the problems that are there. It is a pleasure to be with you all here. Uh, Dr. Heba and Professor Hisham, as a distinguished guest, it's a pleasure to have you on board of this uh, talk as well. Uh, I would like to uh, leave the microphone to my uh, colleagues, uh, Milita Perez, Dino, uh, Sunini, and uh, Natalie. Thank you so much for having the time to actually support with the session here today. And um, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Khalid. And, uh... Uh, I'm really personally very glad to um, invite you again, uh, Dino. Uh, Dino Venturino mm -hmm. is LCB Reference Solutions Sales Manager, and I think we met uh, virtually also last uh, December. Yes. We yes, had a great right. session, and uh, I personally really enjoyed it, and I'm sure everyone will enjoy tonight's uh, session too. Excellent, Please, Dino. excellent. I, I just want to say, uh, so first of all, um, I'm responsible for everything on the African continent from, from Cape Town to Cairo and everything in between when it comes to reference uh, solutions, specifically ebooks. And uh, tonight's talks, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's really um, on everyone's on mind at the moment, especially with our, with our uh, 2020 to 2030 uh, SDG goals. Uh, and I want this to be a, very much a foundation that we can hopefully build on with future webinars. So this would be very much a foundational introduction to it, to publishing uh, according to SDGs. And then I'd like to take it uh, further going forward. So I, I'd love to be invited back again to, to continue this kind of thread. But from, from myself and my team, thank you very much for, for having us here. And I'm, I'm excited to hear what the uh, ladies are presenting tonight. Thank you. We are all excited too, and uh, I would like to um, introduce Dr. Hisham and Chelsea, Director of the Institute of Byproduct Development at the University of Technology, Malaysia, who's joining us tonight from Malaysia. Actually, it's uh, very late at his side, maybe 12 a.m. now. So we uh, would like to thank you for your time and sharing your expertise with us. Please, Dr. Hisham. Yeah, thank you very much for the conference unit, Prof. Heba and Dr. Zahra and being a part in this platform uh, on behalf of UTM and the Institute of Bioproducts Development, we thank you very much. And I'm very happy that we are now running a conference or, or a webinar around the globe. There is no dead zone now, and uh, we come from everywhere. Uh, actually, the topic was very catchy for me when you're talking about uh, SDG, which is now timely which is giving uh, not just the publishing according to SDG, then in the backyard of this, we can start doing research on SDG, which is, as we know now, we are all facing global problem. There's nothing's called regional anymore. And maybe the solution of COVID could be come from Gabon, could be come from Tanzania, could be come from small village here or there, or small research institutes in the oceans or in Asia. Therefore, this platform, led by Elsevier and this idea is the are beyond the publisher, beyond a company, but we are uh, global leaders in something to teach people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being part of our event tonight, Professor Hisham. Uh, I would like to hear from Melita Perez. Uh, actually, maybe it's our first time to meet tonight and uh, hopefully not the last time. Actually, I've been um, contacting uh, maybe uh, a lot of actually Elsevier team members and uh, it's a great uh, privilege to have you here tonight. Uh, Melita uh, Perez, the customer consultant for the Emerging Markets and Latin America team. Thank you for being here. 
Please, Melita. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is an honor to be here and to be with everybody. Um, as Bino said, well, we're very happy to be here and I will be supporting anyone that needs it. <laughs> Thank, you very much. Very <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know you will be start sharing the screen from your side yes. so we can uh, introduce our speakers for tonight. Um, Ms. Natalie uh, Farah and Ms. Zin Sonini Yura, if I'm pronouncing it uh, right, so please correct it for me. Uh, acquisition editors at Elsevier uh, will be talking to us about uh, their expertise from publishing departments, how to improve your research output. Actually, just your your um, your volume. Mine? Great. No, no, it's me. Uh, no, no, sorry, I was just saying. You. Yeah, no worries. I wasn't sure if we're doing our introductions or waiting. That's why there was the gap. Um, but I <laughs> could go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to be speaking first today, and so um, I am a senior acquisitions editor. I've been with Elsevier now since 2013, so that's a little over eight years at this point. Um, I'm responsible for publishing research reference content in, in neuroscience in the reference group. Um, before I joined Elsevier, I was in the academic world. I completed my honors Bachelor of Science as well as my PhD degrees at the University of Toronto, which is where I'm originally from. Um, I was working on developing an in vitro uh, stem cell model, an IPS stem cell model of autism spectrum disorder. Um, so I was in the neuroscience world in a different way there. Um, I have been presenting at many author workshops and scientific conferences over the years. Um, and uh, science communication is a very big passion of mine. So I'm so happy to be here today. And I would like to welcome everyone. Um, marhaba, bienvenue, all the languages I can think of uh, because we have so many countries on the line. But um, yeah, I'm based out of our Toronto, Canada office. So right now it's a little bit after noon, um, but I was previously based in our San Diego office when I first started to work at Elsevier. So um, I'm happy to be with you all here, uh, albeit virtually and hoping that when the world is a bit more normal, we can continue these kind of relationships and maybe even in person. So Thank you for the time. And I guess Sanini can introduce herself too. If you go to the next slide, please. Hi, hello. Um, so I'm from Elsevier since 2014. Um, I have been working for the engineer portfolio for a long time. Since, since 2016, I'm working on the biomedical engineer portfolio. And now I have started working on the medical reference portfolio. Uh, I have worked in many areas in the publishing industry and have attended conferences and workshops around the world. I enjoy working with authors and editors. I work a lot with analytics and communication analysis in the narrative. And I'm pleased to be here today to share how we use that alongside other factors to develop exciting and high usage book content. Thank you very much for having me. Great. So uh, today we will be covering the following topics that are listed here. Um, first, our content acquisition strategy, which uses technology to create high quality in demand content. Um, we are, of course, going to be talking about sustainable development uh, goals, I, I also known as SDGs. First of all, what they are and how Elsevier is partnering with universities to achieve progress towards these goals. Um, we'll then shift to why we publish books and an overview of the different book content types that we have, which all address different kinds of needs. Uh, then we'll go through the entire book publishing process, including how to create a strong proposal, as well as all of the phases from contracting to marketing to give you an idea of how the whole process works. Um, we'll also take a look lastly at the contributions made by Egyptian authors to academic publishing, even though now I know that there's many more people and many more countries represented on the line. So I hope you can all still feel welcome, even with that focus. And finally, we'll, we'll have time to answer your questions as well. So next slide, please. Great. And so first, we'll start off with our content acquisition strategy, um, which again, the goal is to kind of create 
high quant content quality where it's needed the most. So part of that is deciding, figuring out where and, and how to do that. So when we're looking at all of the content we publish, journals, books, et cetera, what is most important for us at Elsevier is that we work to fuel the answers um, that researchers have with the right content. So to do this, we focus our content development on the largest and fastest growing research areas. This ensures that we produce the content most needed by the research community. Um, we also focus on areas where our journal publications are strong. Uh, and this ensures both that we're targeting these high uh, focus areas of people, but also so that we offer the best support to the journal's workflow um, and have our uh, content just be in alliance with each other. So one of the first steps in establishing our strategy then is to use data to identify high growth opportunities for developing content and solutions. And we base this on research trends, um, on funding, on usage uh, of users, uh, plus factors like what are the most influential institutions and authors in the subject area, what research is most cited um, or highly regarded. And this is different, of course, for different subject areas. And as I said, I work in neuroscience. This is going to be very different than for say Sanini or any of our other colleagues who work in different portfolios. At the same time, it is essential to make sure our book offerings al align with our journal program, like we said, so that we, we're meeting all of the needs of our users, like all of you. So this helps us figure out what content to create for our portfolios, but again, it's at a very high level. And so this way we can ultimately figure out um, and, and publish the most authoritative content from the wide variety of research fellows. So you really have to kind of narrow it down. And we do this a lot by focusing on the areas where primary research is big, it's growing, and it's well-funded. Um, we do this to um, um, through commissioning activities, through strategic partnerships, and the focus is this is what folk, uh, drives our acquisitions and it drives the mergers that we often have with different societies and institutions and so on. And so in recent years, we we always look at what different areas are still a focus to us. And sometimes that changes. Um, and that often means sometimes we acquire different publishing houses to strengthen those areas, like with Gulf professional publishing for those of you who work in engineering. And again, this is all to make sure that we bring content to the growing areas that our researchers and students that use our content need. Next slide, please. And the breadth of subject areas we cover can be seen here in this slide by a list of all the disciplines we publish book content in. So we have, as I mentioned, I work in neuroscience. We have many acquisition editor colleagues like myself who work in each of these areas to make sure that they are all represented in our book content and meet those needs. Um, similarly, we have different journal publishers that work in each of these areas as well. So that way we can make sure that both are represented well um, and have a lot of attention being given to them um, by a wealth of people. Um, it's important for us to cover this breadth of subjects, which we do, again, by using data to identify trends and to identify gaps where we see that there is a lot of research going on, there's a lot of focus, but there just isn't as much book content. And, and those are a lot of the areas that interest us. Next slide, please. And so a little bit now about how we use various tools and data to develop content on emerging topics. So how is it, what data am I talking about? So again, we look at the fastest growing research areas. This ensures that the content we make is what people actually want, what people actually are looking for. Um, we also make it align with journals. Um, so we also focus on areas where our journal publications are strong. We often work with journal authors of popular papers and see how their work would transfer into a book project. And so we establish our strategy every year by using data to identify those high growth areas. Um, at the same time, we have to look at areas that are new, areas that are growing, but maybe they don't have as many papers in them um, and where the funding is going. So we use, to do all of this, we use Elsevier tools like Scopus, SciVal, and ScienceDirect. I'm sure many of you are familiar with at least some of these. And we use these to gather data on research activity, on funding, on authors, on institutions. Um, you can see this in the left side of the slide. 
Also on the bottom left, what's important in the graph is you can see the insights we get from those fields. We can see who is using our book content, which institutions, um, and this will help us identify actual publishing opportunities, which people that we should be reaching out to, or if people reach out to us, you know, seeing where they're aligned with, what institutions they work in, what work they've done um, to make them relevant for this topic. We use these same tools to do that as well. And so in the right-hand square, you can see um, more of that data that we get from SciVal and from other sources. So we assess what users prioritize themselves and we identify topics and gaps that way. Uh, we analyze all of that information together to see, okay, there are books missing here and to anticipate what people will need in the future. So the result is high demand content from leading editors that fill these, these gaps of knowledge over time. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, perfect. So there's a little bit of a delay on my side. So again, we use data from Scopus and Cybell to identify authors as well. So not just those topic areas, as well as drawing on our own context we have, our own networks. When the world is less virtual, we attend meetings, we meet people that way. A lot of the times people approach us with their book ideas. Um, that this is something that's becoming increasingly prevalent. And, um, and this is a way that we identify authors as well. So it's not just our research that we do, but we do use the same data to, to look into individuals and to use that in our support for why a project should go forward. Um, we use these tools also, and we can help editors of books. If a book is edited versus authored, we can help the editor actually identify contributors using these same tools. So if they're picking people from their field, this is one way that we can help them uh, with those kind of contacts and to help them build a robust list of contributors that will match the table of contents that they have in mind. We we work to, we hope to, uh, we pride ourselves on developing long lasting relationships with our authors that go beyond the published book. And we often collaborate with our authors for more than books, for strategy. Every year we do voice of the customer things where we speak to our um, editors, authors, customers, and get their advice on what we should be publishing and what strategy we should be using, as well as input on other future projects if they think we should also be publishing in, in this area and so on. Um, the outcome, of course, is the right content. It's pulled from various sources and disciplines, of, and, and hopefully it's a high value. Value means that it meets a real need. It delivers quality as well as content, and it's produced uh, using technology to ensure that it is fully searchable and discoverable, because now we all work with both print content, e-content, especially e-content if you're using Science Direct. And it's really important for whatever content we publish, not only to be high quality, but to be actually searchable and discoverable. Because if you can't find it, it could be the best book ever, um, but it's not going to be used. And so we, we have systems now that are optimized to work alongside our journal's content and make sure um, all of our works are actually searchable, discoverable, and, and better usable by our readers. And all of the careful work that's done behind this, which I've been describing in the previous slides, ensures that our book projects are all well planned out and, and they're set up to succeed when they publish. That is, that is our goal, at least. Um, next slide, please. So as mentioned, it's not just data. We obviously talk to people too. This forum, for example, is one way we speak to customers, we speak to users and researchers, um, because it's very important for us to listen to the voice of the user, to the voice of the customer. And so we actually have a formal program that we call Voice of the Customer, which is um, a set of interviews that we do every year. Each acquisition editor like myself and Sanini will do this. And we collectively all acquisition editors together speak to around 200 people a year. Um, and each acquisition editor interviews a cluster of customers, which includes researchers, scientists, engineers, students uh, that work in their own field, for me, neuroscience. And this feedback is, is really valuable for us because it helps us get closer to the readers to, again, inform our future strategy so that we know these are areas people want book content in because they're telling us that that's what they want. They're telling us that this is the pro these are the problems that they have in their everyday research. So we rely a lot on our customers and reviewers to support 
our authors and our projects and to add value wherever we can. So on this slide, you can see some of the key learnings that we've taken from this feedback from these interviews. So uh, what is highlighted a lot is that research is so multidisciplinary and our books need to support that. They need to be broad in many ways and be applicable across different disciplines. We have learned that visuals, of course, are, are very critical. Readers are generally visual learners. So figures, tables, photo sets are very important within books um, and, and should be a requirement, not just something on the side. We also learned that customers want quick answers and solutions to the problems they have, because what is common across everybody, everywhere they work, they want their research, they want their work to be done quickly, efficiently. If they have issues, they want uh, help troubleshooting it so that they can be more efficient and, and finish. So um, especially with the pressures that people, everyone has on their time. So quick answers and solutions are things that our books need to highlight. It also needs to be information that is trusted, um, that clearly explains processes so that it's reproducible. Obviously, this is very huge in, in every kind of research, every kind of clinical uh, trial situation and so on. And so all this insight together leads us to make our own changes and investment to support readers. Uh, for example, having better visuals, uh, questions at the end of chapters for people who want those quick answers and so on. Next slide, please. So we're going to shift now to sustainable development goals, which is something that obviously is highlighted um, in the presentation. And we can first start with talking about what SDGs are. So in 2015, the United Nations, along with 193 different states, signed an agreement called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this plan identified 17 um, SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals that are linked to 169 different targets to deliver by the state by 2030. So these targets are calls to action by all countries to stimulate um, action and areas of importance that are critically important to humanity in the, and the environment and to everyone in the world. So even though everyone may be affected differently. So you can see those 17 here on the screen. And we're actually going to focus on one of these in a case study. This, that will be number seven for affordable and clean energy, which, of course, impacts everyone in, in a different way in their life. Um, it is worth noting that many of these SDGs go hand in hand with each other to improve health and education, to reduce inequality, uh, to uh, spur economic growth, all while, of course, tackling climate change as well. And many of the other issues that plague society, like uh, gender inequality and so on. So the UN has identified this decade, 2020 to 2030, as the decade of action. So while there has been some progress in targets, it's, it's really not happening at the speed or scale that's necessary to achieve them by the end of the decade. So in September of 2019, the UN Secretary General called on all sectors of society to, to be better at this, to mobilize for a true decade of action on many levels. And the first level is, is global to secure resources and smarter resolutions. People can't do this without the right resources. The second is local action. That means transitions and policies and budgets and frameworks for governments and local authorities to actually make those changes. And the third is people action. And this includes academia, this includes youth, private sectors, and so on. So one example is the University of Johannesburg to generate movement and push for change. And this change can happen through advancing your research among many other ways. And for us, it means publishing in these important areas. So everyone can contribute in a different way. Next slide, please. So here is one example looking at the University of Johannesburg, which is already doing some pretty fantastic work uh, advancing research within many of the SDGs. So uh, this slide was put together from using data from our platform, Cybel and Scopus. So we can show you again what kind of data we can pull. And anyone can pull if they have Cybel access. Uh, and the list of SDGs are ranked by the amount of publication input from the university, and it's in this teal column. So the first column called scholarly output. You can see the yellow column um, that is uh, what we call field-weighted citation, which is high in many categories because anything over one means that that work is highly cited. And the reddish column of ranking displays where the University of Johannesburg ranks 
in, com in that area in comparison to other universities in South Africa, just as a sample. So you'll notice that SDG number eight, which is decent work and economic growth, is, an, is a number one global ranking for this university. So it's something that they've been working on a lot. So is SDG number seven, affordable and clean energy, which I mentioned earlier, as well as um, SDG number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. So again, similar types of sustainability goals, um, but it's a lot of hard work that has been put in by the institution to be so strong in these areas. So today, as an example, as mentioned, we're going to focus on uh, SDG number seven, affordable and clean energy. And we're going to focus a little bit about how the university and Elsevier have aligned together to, to make progress in this goal. Next slide, please. So Elsevier's parent company is called Relics, um, R-E-L-X, which some of you may be familiar with. And we are actually a signatory on the UN Global Compact, which says that SDGs need to use business participation in achieving these aims. So we have a, a, a contractual role in a way to take part in all of this. And so with over 1.4 million scholarly papers uh, related to SDGs published from 2015 to 2019, so the last five years of the last decade, researchers, there's there's too much data, there's too much content, and it, people are, are are often overwhelmed in their own research areas and broader. And so, again, we use our analytics like we did in that last slide um, and our strengths in acquiring data and, and generating those analytics to help navigate the sea of information. And, um, and these snapshots here are just an example of, of things that we make freely available. So on the left is our Relics SDG Resource Center, which hosts the latest science law, business events um, across the company and key partners that are all um, working together to bring better awareness and understanding of SDGs to our customers, uh, to researchers, and to, to governments that are hoping to take a, a bigger role. Uh, the middle is our SDG graphic, which we started releasing in late 2020, that shows key metrics for research output, um, collaboration, and impact for SDGs. And on the right is our sustainability science hub, which hosts um, analytical reports that people can access to better understand sustainability science, to examine the, the publication number in, in these areas, uh, opportunities to collaborate, as well as tools to help um, individuals and institutions make um, their own evidence-based interventions. Links to all these tools are available in the final slides of these presentations, so you can check them out. And I'm pretty sure we're going to make these available uh, later on to everybody. Next slide, please. And I think I saw some messages about this kind of stuff, but we also offer the Elsevier Research Academy, which provides free access to countless e-learning resources that help you in your research journey. So a variety of topics, but I mention it right now specifically because we actually have a section devoted to advancing sustainable development goals. And topics include how to make your research gender balanced, how to protect the environment while doing your work. Um, and you'll be able to download a certificate for, uh, attending our presentation today later on as well. And I think there's information about that later on in the presentation. Next slide, please. You can see from this slide um, that we are publishing in a variety of SDG areas as well. So we gave one example of energy, but Elsevier is participating in, in in a variety of these goals. And we have today over 745 books that are related to sustainability or keywords for that SDG. Um, and these are organized into 20 different science direct subject classifications, uh, such as neuroscience, energy, engineering, and food science. Um, and so it, it goes well beyond a few of the SDGs. And it's something that we are trying to do is, is to focus on all of these areas. So that includes titles on climate change, biodiversity, health and well-being, and so on. Uh, so we've talked about how universities are advancing SDGs. And we've talked about how Elsevier is, is um, helping to do that by publishing in those areas. Now let's bridge the two and showcase an example of how together a university and Elsevier uh, can create successful advancements in SDGs. And we're gonna look at a case study of just one example, though we have many others, of a book that we published directly related to sustainability and SDGs. And we can talk about how the book came into being, how the authors and acquisition editor partnered together and developed the book. Next slide, please. 
So this will be about SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, and how we use data to, to create this partnership and to publish this book. So obviously over the last two decades, there's been a great deal of research on nano structured materials for solar cell application, something everywhere, especially places that have a lot of sun, like say Egypt. Um, and this is driven, of course, by the need for high efficiency and to have cost effective materials as well within renewable energy field. So um, a lot of this has been focused on metal oxide based solar cells, uh, polymer nano composite solar cells, nano carbon based materials like graphene and so on. So there's a lot of different kinds of research in these areas. Uh, we can see here in the blue bar graph that there's been an output of 5,400 journal articles related to these particular topics a field weighted citation impact of 1.73, which again, anything over one means something is highly cited, and a growth of over 15% in the output over this five-year time frame. So just like in our pre and other examples, the data strongly suggests that there's there would be a big audience for this. So we were contacted then by Professor Samuel Oluwatobi Oluwafemi and Dr. El Haji Mamusaho from the University of Johannesburg, who joined three other editors and made a diverse team. Um, and they recruited diverse chapter contributors from throughout the world to have uh, a global perspective on this topic. And in the summer of 2019, we Elsevier published their book, which was called The Nanomaterials for Solar Cell Applications, which discussed the synthesis, um, application, characterization of traditional and new material in, in solar cell uh, in the solar cell field, including covered, uh, including emerging nanomaterials like graphene. So um, this is still a growing area, of course, and there's more and more information all the time. Um, but it was a timely publication that helps support um, our mission of combating carbon emissions within the energy sector and aligns, of course, with our SDG pursuits. Um, not only does it do that, it offers real world insights that our audience appreciates. Um, and it will inspire further research and greater understanding in this area using nanomaterials for solar cell applications in a sustainable way. So these partnerships that Elsevier has created um, produce impactful knowledge that meets a global sustainable development need. And in the process, we hope that we can also make our authors and editors happy by focusing on their research and, and advancing their research in a way that ultimately advances society. Next slide, please. So in this decade of action, and given the tremendously challenging global circumstances our world still faces, not only during the pandemic, but in what seems like constant climate crisis is everywhere, um, our goal is to partner with you and help you meet your research demands, ensuring productivity so that you and your institutions can also excel and, and, and we can do whatever we can to make that happen. So um, how do we do all that? We'll, we'll talk about that as well. So next slide, please. And I think um, Dr. Zara might actually introduce this, but it's a poll on what SDG, in your opinion, is your institution or your research uh, most aligned with. And this lists all 17 of the SDGs. It's just that there's so many of them. So you may have to pick them in the separate categories, pick two. Um, Uh, yeah, Natalie, we have split the question uh, in no two different um, uh, questions so that we can put eight SDGs yes. in the first one and the, the remaining in the other one. So we may choose more than one answer if you like. And I'm not, um, because I don't see the poll results coming in, um, I hope my fellow panelists can tell me when, um, when to wrap up the poll. Um, and we can see what, um, yeah, what in people's views, they feel their own research is best aligned with. Because for example, for me in neuroscience, um, some of these SDGs obviously are not things that we work towards in neuroscience. Um, they're conflicting, but there are other features that, that absolutely do. And it really depends on the project as well. And so um, this is different for all areas. This is different for all researchers. And um, you, you may or may not find something that aligns best with what you work on. So do we have those results in? 
Yes. That's okay, they're, still, they're still coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Okay, great. Sorry, Richard. Uh, it's oh, it's right. quite interesting, quite an interesting result, I must say. Yes, we're at yeah. uh, 16%, 17%. They're, they're still coming in. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a lot of people, so <laughs> it will be... It will take some time, but yes, if uh, people can submit their what they think, and of course, if you don't feel that your research aligns with any one of these, you can list none of the above. I know, for example, in neuroscience, a lot of ours aligns with good health and well-being, uh, because that's something that when you're talking about the brain makes sense. Um, this will be different for Sonini and her research areas, or some of our other engineering colleagues who may be working in energy, um, someone who might be working in food science will be related to zero hunger or no poverty. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of different areas that sometimes don't seem very obvious, but for science people like myself, you're going to have things like good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality sometimes is a factor as well. If you're talking about, um, we had a book that's on migraine and there were there was a lot of content on how um, migraine can be different in women and men. Uh, symptoms can be a little bit different and, and so on. And the prevalence is different. It's more common in one gender over the other. And that happens, of course, with a lot of different conditions, disorders. So a topic like that, that you wouldn't necessarily relate to say gender equality happened to have a lot there because it promotes research and clinical trials that look at different populations so that whatever results you have actually are relevant to a wide variety of people. So you'd be surprised um, how these go. How is the poll looking? Maybe we can close it if, uh, if it's not moving too much. That's wonderful. So that's a lot of, that's a broad area actually, which is very cool. I think it looks like quality education, good health and well being are, are fairly high. Um, we have areas in responsible consumption, sustainable cities. Uh, this is actually really interesting. There's a, it's very broad. It's, it's, um, and that's what I mean, where sometimes it's not as obvious what that you work on something like that until you really think about it, until you see the choices in front of you and realize that, oh, I guess I do work in, in an area that, that, that aligns with these sustainable development goals. And so um, thank you everybody for participating in that. I think that's really, at least for me, very informative um, because as mentioned, it's just something that you, some, if you don't really sit there and think about it, it's hard to really realize that the work you're doing goes so far beyond the work you're doing yourself. So great. Okay. Well, I think um, we can go to the next slide, which Sanini will take over here. So thank you again for, for listening to me. And of course, at the end, if you have any questions, um, I, I will still be here, but I'm going to let Sanini now talk a bit more about um, why we publish books. Thank you very thank much, you. Natalie. Please. Thank you, me. Natalie. So now we'll go through a few slides about books and why it's important to publish them followed by an overview of the various types of content that Elsevier publishes so that you know what to expect from us when you begin to collaborate to publish your research content with us, including but not limited to SDGs. Next slide, please. So um, the book has come a long way. When the printing press was invented in 1440, it was one, one of the most influential events in the second millennium. But books over the last 20 years have changed um, books used to be read from cover to cover, from start to finish, from page one to the very end. And that's no longer true. After the, after the first e-reader e hit the march around 1997, books, um, sorry, uh, <coughs> books were no longer the same. People began um, to navigate direct to the parts they wanted. Um, bookmarking and only reading what they need and when they need it. And around that same time, publishers began to see a need to organize data, make it searchable, discoverable, and available in Elsevier's case using the Science Direct platform. It's important for us to understand research workflow, needs, and behavior. Many of you are involved in interdisciplinary research and the common needs that we hear from researchers are, 
how to get up to speed with a given topic, how to answer a specific question, how to analyze results. And at Elsevier, we address these needs via multiple types of content to find the exact answer that researchers are looking for. It doesn't really matter to a researcher where the answers come from, whether a journal or a book, as long as they can find the right answer quickly. To do this, Science Direct integrates content, technology, and analytics. Next, please. So studies have shown that the use of Science Direct shortens the research process, saving an average of 47 minutes a day. Each day, SDG research access an average of 79,000 book chapters and 1.2 million journals articles. Here we see co-usage at work of both books and journals. Again, researchers don't care about what format and content type. They just want answers and the technology work behind the scenes in Science Direct can provide it. Both books and journals provide different types of content, but it is this very reason that they are fundamentally interlinked. And also why we work with our journal's colleagues to provide reliable, timely, and advanced resources that meet the needs and desires of our readers. Journals provides, uh, journal articles provides um, depth in growing disciplines. It provides specialized knowledge in a distinct area. It's a, it has a very narrow focus. It goes into extreme, extreme depth of coverage of a topic, and it will focus on the very latest research and new results. All of this is important to researchers and the students. Um, book content, on the other hand, provides span connecting disciplines together. It provides a broad view of topics. Um, it allows for experts' opinions on multiple foundation topics, and the complex complexity of differing opinions can all be collated in one source. And finally, books have the ability to provide related fields, methods, and materials all in one place. All of this is equally important to research and students. So what does that mean? Very simple. Research and students need both types of content to build their complete knowledge of a topic area. One cannot replace the other. Next, please. And here is a look of, of some of the, those book, to, book types. We, we regard all, all books as the knowledge repository from which we learn. And you see this below in the pyramid at the bottom of the slide. Major reference works are positioned at the base of our pyramid these products provide comprehensive and foundation introductions to a discipline area. They are presented as encyclopedias or are reference models. As you glance up the pyramid, next, next you see textbooks. These provide a pedagogical examination of subject areas, concepts, and methods. Textbooks provide the knowledge required when studying a discipline. One level of both textbooks are handbooks. These tend to compile data sets, methods, process, and techniques specific to a particular field and often provide quick answers on the job. Next are monograph and single volume reference, which include both altered and edited works. These titles are comprehensive and show advanced and detailed descriptions for in-depth coverage of a specific subject areas. Next are serious. These are highly cited publications that offer an in-depth look at the latest development in a particular field. Finally, at the tip of this pyramid, you see journals, journal review articles and primary research, which need to contain the most recent advances in the field. All of these formats works together to answer the questions of research and students along their learning journey and when considering authoring you should consider which type of content you to pursue. Next, please. Overview of content, I would now like to take a moment to ask you about the research you do in the following pool. What type of content is most useful to your research? The types we discussed in the previous, previous slides are again listed here. So, the choices are major reference works, textbooks, handbooks, monograph and single volume reference, serials, journal review articles, journal articles, or a combination of the above.
Thank you everyone for participating. We're at 30% uh, of the answers from everyone. Do we have all the results in? Uh, we're at 36. I Maybe we can wait a little bit so that it's at 50% or a little bit more. Yes, or right now we're at 40%. I think we may give them a little bit of time. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to participate and interact with our poll. Uh, this will be helpful for both of us, uh, for both sides actually, for um, our speaker and for you to be thinking about the content that would be most useful to your research. Either major reference works, textbooks, handbooks, monographs and single volume references, serials, journal review articles, journal articles, or a combination of the above? I think there is one easy answer here. Thank you so much. We're at 47%. And um, I will end the poll in a few seconds. We're at 49% and just at 50. Okay, so I'm going to end it and share the results. Everyone should be seeing it right now. Yes, thank so, you. Melita. Yes, we can see that journal articles and journal review articles are most of the people are using, but as the obvious <laughs> answer is a combination of the both. So thank you for all to participate in this poll. So next slide, please. Um, okay, so we regularly survey our authors and recently conduct 58 authors interviews to identify their motivations for writing. Following up with a questionnaire, which received over 200 responses on the motivations for writing a book. Here on this slide, you can see the top four benefits which authors identify from writing books according to that survey. Uh, first, an interest in the subject and enjoyment of researching and writing on the topic. You have a general passion to share great knowledge and experience with others. Um, the second one is to fill information gap in the market. So with love conducting your own research, you may have identified yourself that information is lacking on a particular topic and you think there is a gap which needs filling to help progress research further. Another one is to gain stronger reputation and stand in your field. Books and book chapters will be published to a global audience through a platform such as Science Direct. Books, chapters can be indexed in Scopus and contrib contributed to your ancient decks and so on. And to provide materials to support your own teaching course, and you may have a strong desire to educate and share information with the next generation. Um, the fifth motivation, which is not mentioned on this slide, is the desire to leave a legacy of one's accumulated knowledge. Next, please. So by now, I hope I have convinced you that writing a book is worth effort. It's now time to determine if you want to be an editor or an author. Author means that you will write every word from cover to cover. Editing means that you manage a manuscript which will have individual chapters contributors. So some of you, some of you here may have written book chapters in the past or even author or edit a book yourself. There are some distinct differences between those two workflows, but I'm going to start by highlight their similarities. So um, both editors and authors should be know and respect the expert from their field able to identify a market need. This includes a clear understanding of the subject matter and the target audience for who the content is for. Able to plan the scope of the content to ensure all of the needs of the market are met. They are both supported by Elsevier's in-house staff throughout the entire publishing process, allowing them to produce a high quality end product. And finally, both are paid by the publisher in the form of a royalty. Now the difference. Volume authors writing from cover to cover, 
volume authors are expected to write at least 100,000 K plus words in about a year time. True, this can be often is quite longer than a year. They need to deliver a well referenced manuscript. The manuscript needs to explain the science and how to apply it. And it is also important for volume authors to have interdisciplinary expertise. This allows them to deliver content for readers with various backgrounds. Next, we have volume editors, managing chapters contributors. Volume editors are expected to design the table of contents for the book comprehensively and fully cover the subject area. They need to secure, secure all the individual chapters authors, and they need to perform the overall scientific, scientific editorial review of each individual chapters. And finally, chapter authors, those that contributed chapters to the volume editor. Chapter authors will work closely with the volume editor to plan chapter coverage, avoiding overlap and gaps. They expect to write between seven to 10,000 K words in approximately, approximately six months. There is no payment to chapter authors, but also no fees to pay. Um, deciding which of this workflow work best for you, your time and your experience. Also your capabilities. We, you will have an impact on how successful your author experience is. Now that you know the workflow that best fits your needs, let's talk about what makes a premium author or editor. Next slide, please. So the attributes of your premium author vary by field and industry. Generally speaking, however, premium authors and editors will have some or all of the following. High college publication rating, a good teaching index, good standing at a well-known institution or company, uh, know for a broad knowledge of subject area and the ability to share this knowledge in an interdisciplinary manner. Establish connection in the field. This is especially important if they are the editor of a volume and will need to solicit, solicit a chapter from co contributors. A position in related academic society and they should have involvement in key related journals boards. Well, um, after that list, you are thinking to yourself, who is the award meets all the criteria? And if they didn't meet the criteria, how would they have the time to write a book? Well, with all that said, I do want to mention that exceptions have and can be made. So even if someone does not meet all these criteria, they can work with an acquisitions editor to get advice on how to develop a plan for publication. Next, please. For our last poll of the day, after that discussion, we are curious to know what are your own personal reasons for wanting to write a book? Is it interest, passion in the subject, enjoyment of researching and writing on the topic, to fill an information gap in the market, to gain a strong reputation and stand in your field, to provide materials to support your own teaching resource, teaching courses, and our desires to educate, and desire to leave a legacy of your knowledge, or any other reason not listed here? But given a minute to, to, to answer the questions to the pool. It's going, Melita. Thank you, yes. We're more than 30% right now. So uh, we're about to uh, get to 30% of the answers for the participation of everybody. Thank you, everybody. We are more than 40%. So in a few seconds, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Okay, right now we're at 48, 48%. Okay, thank you. So everybody should be able to see the results right now. 
Well, most of you have answered passion, the subject, chair, enjoyment. Oh, that's nice. So that's good. So next slide, please. So now that you have been convinced to be an author or editor, let's take a closer look at the publishing process itself and what we can expect as an author with Elsevier. Next slide, please. So the first step is a book proposal. The proposal writing process is not intended to be a daunting process and a good acquisitions editor will guide you through each step. A standard book proposal will formally cover seven key topics. Uh, the title, you want your talk to be broad enough to attract a large audience, but not so popular that the market is saturated with publications. So carefully select your topic and find a title that succinctly summarizes it using keywords. The subject and market need. Uh, take, time to, take time to discuss the need your book will fill in the market and address any information gap of your target audience and explain how your publication will help solve these gaps. Next is author credentials. So what is about that what, what is about you that makes you appropriate for the subject area of the book? Credentials are important here, but so is your motivation. So what's your story? Also, your intended audience and its needs. So know your audience and tailor your content and features of the book to address the needs of your audience. Trying to make a general book that appeals to everyone is not ideal. It is approach to always fall short. It's better to target a group and meet their needs fully. Geograph, where will this topic sell best in the world and why? Are there geographic limitations to the audience? Uh, what are they and what might be done to increase international appeal? The competition, are you aware of any recent publications or manuscripts in preparation that are likely to compete with your proposal title? This includes uh, including strengths and weakness of these titles, as well how your title will be different, different or better. And final, finally, manuscript specifications and timelines. So how many pages you anticipate, number of figures, uh, will color be needed, and how long will it take to write or compile the book? Uh, in books, the publisher covers the production costs. So with color image, for example, this is different. Uh, there is no charge to the authors for the book to be printed in color. Uh, high quality book proposal makes the review process go more quickly and minimize the needs for queries and multiple rounds of edits. The more effort you put into your proposal upfront, the more likely it is to be accepted. Next, please. So once your proposal is complete, it's time to submit. During this stage, the book proposal goes through several phases. First, the proposal is submitted to the acquisitions editor. The acquisitions editor will review it and may have some questions or additional information that needs to be filled out. Once the acquisitions editor is satisfied with the proposal, they will send it for peer review. This process is different from peer review for journals. The journals process often begin much more critical. Here, the focus is on make sure you have feedback on your proposal to straighten. Uh, the peer review process can take anywhere from two weeks or more. And during this time, the acquisitions are solicited review from the market, which are then compiled. The AE will then create an editorial analysis with highlight requests for changes in the scope of the content if needed. The editorial analysis is, the, is then reviewed by authors and editors, and the revised proposal is created together. Once both parties are happy with the scope of the content, the book is formally proposed at the publisher and finally approved. After project approval, your acquisition editor will deliver a contract. We do this electronically using DocSign. Your final manuscript due date, which was determined by you, will be clearly specified within the contract and it's critical to maintain this data, data as sales and micro efforts are tied to it. Copyright is held by Elsevier and guidelines for authors who use our outlining contract. Elsevier offers reasonable terms for he use with permission. Copyright with uh, Elsevier is important for both the global dissemination of the book content as well, as well the ability of Elsevier to be able to fight piracy. And finally, editor and author royalties and complementary copies are outlined. Next, please. The next phase of the process is manuscript development. During this phase, an editorial project manager or APM will be assigned to your project. EPMs are expert in manuscript development and will be able to guide you throughout the process. They will provide you with detailed author's guidelines. 
your manuscript will be delivered in our ELSA authoring platform. This is something I, I'm very excited about. ELSA is some of the most exciting technology to hit the publishing industry in a long time. And it is exclusive to ELSA Vier. ELSA is an easy to use online and to end content creation platform. It is used, used by authors, editors, contributors, and Elsevier staff. It allows you to write and view real time. Imagine writing in your manuscript and then just clicking on a button, you can see it's completely laid out in pages. This is amazing technology and that allows you to see what used to take weeks in a matter of minutes. The platform also allows for editing, seamless collaboration, and tracking progress of your chapters. And the best part is that Inheritance creates richer content by providing such as tagging, leaking, and structuring. And once the manuscript is completed, it's time to go to production. Some of the manuscript elements you may be asked to include your final list of contributors. Uh, this is unique to edit works, uh, as author work won't have chapters contributors. Uh, sample chapter prior to final manuscript to check the format and the style to make sure it is in production ready. This is especially important in authored works where only one person is responsible for all chapters. Text, equations, tables, and reference, keywords, abstract, and art. Not every book has all these elements, of course. Permissions for any third party content. At this time, you will also review your cover image and back cover copy, making sure that the cover tells the story of the book to the customers. We use cover designers to make sure whatever vision you have for your cover is captured. And some optional items may include preface, forward, glossary, and any appendices. Next. At this time, a production manager or PM will join the team. PM are experts in the production process, which includes copy editing of your final draft manuscript, proofreading, indexing, manufacturing. During the copy editing phase, you will be responsible to review all suggested edits and accept and reject them. Copy editors will edit for grammar and spelling, but are not responsible for scientific content. That's your job as the author or editor. Elsevier provides proof reading of all chapters to ensure that all of the changes you request are implemented at the same time. Elsevier also provides index for all titles, and this can be subject or alphabetical according to the content needs. The author editor will review the index before it's finalized. At the end of production, your book will be manufactured. It is a stage that determines the paper, printer, and ensures that the deadline is set at start of the project is met to meet pre-sales orders. Next. Upon publication, your title will be part of our science and technology division, which serves more than 10 million research across 4,500 institutions in 180 countries, giving your product the widest reach possible. Your title will be available as a traditional print book, as well as an e-book. Finally, through our 130 abstract and index service partners, your book content will be indexed and available on discipline-specific databases, including notable names like ScienceDirect, Thomson Reuters, and the Scopus. Our ebook library is also available and discoverable on more than 630 party retails library and special platforms, such as Amazon and Google, Google Play. Next. With all this said about our eBooks and authors, let's also look at the important contributions the country of Egypt is making to academic publishing. Next. The relationship between Egyptian authors and editors continues to grow. The charts on the bottom left show the tremendous growth we've shared together over the decades, in particular in the last 15 years. We have seen almost 1,800 Egyptian authors and editors and over 1,800 Egyptian author chapters in almost 650 books. Again, this is just books, not journals, so this is a quite large number. We would very much like to continue to grow this partnership. Next, please. Egypt has an impressive academic presence in, if you look at overall research performance as well across a variety of fields. In research from 2015 to 2020, 
Egypt boosts over 118,000 scholarly articles by over 94,000 authors. And these articles receive over 950,000 citations. In the pie chart on the right, you can see the many areas of academic publishing that Egyptian authors tackle each year with a substantial contribution in all areas. In particular, medicine in red, engineering tur turquoise, chemistry in blue, biochemistry, genetics, and microbiology, microbiology in light green. Next. With, with some of the tools we have, we can also look at what specific topics academics in Egypt, in Egypt are publishing about in journals. So the pie chart in the last slide showed the most substantial contributions were in medicine and engineering. We can use those tools to actually delve into those subject areas to see exactly which topics most of the journal's publications are on. In medicine, here on the top right of the screen, in shades of red in this tree map, we can see most of those publications are in the areas of surgery, oncology, and radiology, nuclear medicine, and imaging. In engineering below, in the circuit donut, you see electrical and electronic engineering, mechanical engineering, and science, condensed matter physics, atomic and molecular physics, optics. So these are some of the tools we use at Chelsea to first guide our publishing because we can measure where our research needs are, but also help us find authors in these subjects. These topics are often multidisciplinary, just how each individual research often works on multidisciplinary research. Next, please. The last slide of this section highlights some of the titles that we have published by Egyptian authors and editors in the past five years, with a list of some of the affiliations from which our authors, editors, and contributors were from on the right-hand side. As you can see, the content is a vast of the institutions. We are always working to expand our books offering in all disciplines, working with old and new authors and editors, these and the new institutions. Hopefully, this presentation today has given you insight not only into why books are important, but also a better understanding of our book content and the book publishing process, so we can see your name, affiliation, and book in these slides in the future. Um, so there has never been a better time to be involved in writing a book than right now. And with your new insight into Elsevier's book business and the full understanding of the entire book publishing cycle, you are now ready to author or edit your book. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for your time this evening on all of your behalf. It has been my pleasure and we are all happy to take any questions you may have. Over to you, Melita. Thank you. So in the questions and um, answers chat, there's this question that says, do you accept publications in linguistics? I did see that actually. I will have to check. I will enter my email address so that um, Rana can email me and I can check for them who the social sciences person is. And, okay, perfect. and I make that, I think, public, so pe other people should be able to see my email, if I think. If not, you can let me know. So, so uh, Natalie and, and Yura, thank you so much for that. It was great uh, from both of you. Uh, I have a very interesting question here um, from Alfitori Yela, uh, Assistant Professor in Petroleum Engineering. So uh, they say, I have translated one of the most important books in petroleum engineering, Originally uh, published by uh, Al Sufia, uh, uh, yeah, from English to Arabic. Firstly, how can I obtain the permission to publish it? And secondly, can the Arabic version be published by Al Sufia? Yeah. So, if if I'm understanding correctly, the original book is also Al uh, In which case, uh, we most likely have copyright. You know, sometimes there are unique cases where something's different, but you know, 99% or something of the cases we have the copyright. If you have already translated it or you want to translate it, um, I can put you in touch with our, uh, we have a translations group basically that we coordinate with because 
um, the contract that that original editor or author signed with Elsevier will have um, certain arrangements for translation so that they can benefit from it as well. And so basically we have a translation department that I can put you in touch with that would coordinate all of that. So I'm gonna type in my email address into the main and um, you can email me there. And it sounds like you've already translated it. Regardless, it's coordinated with our translations department because they will have to do whatever paperwork and so on that needs to take place. Um, and uh, I would be happy to connect you with them. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I've got, I've got, I wrote one or two questions down that I thought um, the audience would like to know before we started the talk. And one of them was, um, if, if, if uh, a researcher wanted to write about SDGs, which SDG, let's say there's a specific SDG that Egypt is known for, and I could see there was a very big in, in education was one of the highest uh, interest areas, which is very interesting to see. Um, how does a researcher go about selecting an SDG to write about? Um, yeah, I could take this too. Um, when Sanini was talking about the different motivations that people have for writing books, the thing that most people responded with, and what we see when we talk to people generally as well, is that it's their passion or they have an interest in it. So I would say that, of course, everyone's going to have different reasons for why they publish. But if it's an area that you either feel passionate about or you already work on and it's something you feel equipped to write about, um, that's where you start on what topic you're going to do ever. So if the topic that you're interested in is proteomics for, et cetera, et cetera, um, you would approach the, the appropriate acquisition editor for that. Um, and if, if the topic that you picked happens to align with the sustainable development goal, then again, you pick whoever that acquisition editor happens to be in that area. And then the rest will just follow from that relationship. So the, the easiest way is to yourself to identify whatever the topic is. And I would say identifying the topic should be related to what you know you have expertise in, what you feel comfortable writing about, what you would feel passion writing about. And once you have the topic, then you would you can look on our website for who is associated with what. I know online we have a proposal form and people fill that out. And we have a team that actually looks at the proposal and then determines this is the right acquisitions editor for, for it and puts you in touch with them. And so uh, that's really the way it works. So I would suggest to anyone, if there's something you're interested in, whether it's sustainable development goal aligned or not, to fluff out in your head what you want it to be about and then fill out a proposal form. And if it happens to be sustainability linked, you can detail that in that proposal. And once you submit that to our proposal mailbox online, everything after that would just logically follow. So if there were, uh, if, uh, sorry, sorry. Somebody yeah, had a uh, please there. go ahead, Dino. Uh, I have no, something I was just, to add I, later, yeah. Right, so I was, I was just thinking along that same thread, uh, if there were a number of researchers researching different SDGs, yes. could they come together as a team and each of them present a different part of the uh, ebook that they wanted to get or book that they wanted to get published. Could yeah, they do that as a, sure. as a group? You can, assuming the topic is something that's cohesive, right? Um, the topic itself, like, because there will be some topics that accompany many different things, right? So if you're talking about, you know, a really specific example, like solar cells, then that's obviously energy, but you are going to have some topics that let's say encompass no poverty, encompass gender inequality, encompass no hunger in one in one volume because you're talking about something specific in a particular area, let's say that encompasses many SDGs. That's fine because on our end, we don't have different acquisitions editors for different SDGs. We have different acquisitions editors for different subject areas. So it would once you have whatever your subject is, even if it has multiple SDGs, it's still on a specific subject area and it will land with the right person based on what that is. So absolutely, you can see a book that covers many SDGs because the topic is like that, whereas you might see another book that, you know, talks about um gender differences in uh, neurobiology or, you know, in it's, it's, you know, something like that, that's very specific and is clearly one SDG, though even that example, as I said, would be both gender inequality and would be health and well-being. So mm -hmm. you 
will most often have a variety, but it's yeah. text that yeah. will let it go wherever. So basically the message is um, that people don't need to worry about where it will go. You can decide what your subject area is going to be, work with however many people on that proposal, on the agreement that you're going to work together. And then we can figure out the rest of where that best belongs and how we can make that happen for you with whoever the right person is in that subject. Excellent, thank you. Please, Khalid. Yeah, I just want to add something here as well. So we are actually working with the researchers on both ends of the spectrum, as, as you can see here. So today we were discussing that I'm already doing the research. I've accumulated a lot of knowledge and uh, I just want to start sharing and, and maybe trying to put more structure to a new field, for example. And this is part of the reasons why I'd be looking for publishing a book and we talked today about how to align our, or how to check or how an, um, an acquisition editor would actually be able to correlate uh, a published book for, uh, for a number of, um, uh, of evaluation points, including the SDGs, for example. But by the end of the day, we work on the other end of the spectrum when you are working on putting the concept or putting a research point to start tackling. And, and we've, we've had a lot of trainings for this because SciVal by the end of the day is a tool. You use that tool to check research against different metrics, including the SDGs. So we have had multiple trainings and, and workshops, for example, in Egypt, is to actually, when you are working on that very early phase, when you are trying to um, put that very draft idea for your first research proposal is to how to make sure that it can be aligned with trending topics or with sustainable development goals through that modules of analysis within SciVal itself. So you can be using the same tool that Natalie and, and, uh, and Sunini today are using as acquisition editors. You can be using that same tool to actually align your research from the very start. And remember one thing, all researchers affiliated to all Egyptian academic and governmental institutions have access to SciVal. So this is a tool that you can actually be using yourself to make sure that this alignment is already there. That's wonderful. Thank you. And I would say that a lot of the data we show um, is from SciVal specifically. And SciVal itself takes from Scopus. So whether you have access to Scopus or not, that might be different for different institutions. Most of what we took is from SciVal, which is taking from Scopus. So it's, it's in SciVal where, for example, you can look up a subject area and you can see, oh, these are the other, these are the people with uh, the researchers with the highest number of publications in this subject area. This is the with the highest number of H index in this area. These are the top five institutions that, that produce most in this area and so on. You can look for collaborations that way. You can look for keywords that are in that area and you know, devise a new side project for a student or yourself and so on. So it's exactly what, what Khalid is saying that it, you can use it at the very beginning. It doesn't really need to only be a book or anything like that. It can absolutely guide your research in, in every step of the way. And sure, it can also help if you are thinking of writing a book or you're working with us and we also happen to use it, but it's not a tool that, that's only for Elsevier employees. Yep. And, and um, just one good news to actually to share there is that we are actually seeing an improved performance on, for example, the Times Higher Education Impact uh, Rankings, for example. So these are university rankings that measure or that pit the research coming out of a research institution against the SDGs, for example. So these are things that people are actually using and people are, there is more and more attention being put every day on all different aspects. If you're looking about research funding, if you're looking Talking about your uh, um, the likelihood of your re of your research getting published in a journal or getting published in a book, these are topics that people do care about the most because SDGs were defined so that the research can actually be contributing to make to changing people's lives. By the end of the day, it's not just research to be put in in books or it is actually research that is meant to actually create an impact in day to day life. Yeah, I think just on that point, Khalid, there's, there's two very strong branches when it comes to SDGs and publishing according to SDGs. One is definitely 
it's helping the world, it's changing lives, and that's very important. But another point when it comes to SDG is a lot of my institutions from Cape Town to Cairo really have said to me they don't just want publication output anymore for the sake of publication output. They want their publication output to be in line with sustainability. And one of the big reasons for that is that during the 2020, we know COVID was a very difficult time, a lot of governments have cut funding to various institutions. And publishing according to SDGs is a really good way to secure funding for an institution or for a research project or research that you're doing. A lot of funding, actually, in Sub-Saharan Africa, $3 billion was invested in SDG publication alone. Uh, in South Africa, it was $450 million. North Africa, $50 million. And all of the SDGs are line up. Uh, certain areas get a lot more funding for certain SDGs that the, those countries are trying to uh, develop. So, so really, there's, there's a lot of potential when it comes to publishing according to sustainability. Yeah. And it's interesting that for, from our perspective, too, we, um, we're obviously publishing in these areas, but we note it from the very beginning. So we have um, trackers where we keep track of different projects and so on. And we, from the outset, we're indicating now sustainability. Um, and that's because we do sustainability campaigns even every year. So we have one on World Mental Health Day that's coming up that um, for- World it, Water Week this week. Yeah, exactly. There's Water Week this week, which in neuroscience- Six and 14, I think is the- Exactly, which I, in neuroscience, I my books, et cetera, are not involved in that. But I have colleagues in food science absolutely are very busy this week and leading up to this week, you know, contributing free chapters and so on for that World Mental Health Day and so on. So it's something that we are more and more, it's kind of becoming entrenched in our workflow as well. Um, and so it's from the beginning. And I think that's the best way for any research is when you think about these things at the start, especially because when you're working in research, you're a grad student, you're et cetera, I, when I was doing my PhD, you're, you know, you're in your bubble and it's sometimes hard to see how much of a uh, impact what you're doing actually has. And hopefully all of these resources show you that, you know, it's so much more than what you, you feel you're working on, uh, on a week to week basis where you might not have made a lot of ground uh, ultimately in the big picture. It's, it's a really big thing. And, and we're looking at it the same way. So um, I think that's basically it from our side. I don't know if there's any other questions that anybody would like to ask. I can see one, one, one question. So uh, there is a question on the intellectual property rights. Uh, so um, Elsevier, uh, as, as a publisher, Elsevier, how would you describe that uh, we go about the intellectual property rights for our authors? Do they mean in terms of, I didn't see the question, so I can't, I, I didn't see it in its context, but is it just talking about um, in terms of participating in books or is it talking about journals? Um, what, what's the context of what they're talking about in terms of? I believe it's a general question, but I would yeah. say that in this case, it, it, I believe it's more relevant to books. Yeah, so this is my assumption here. Yeah, so ultimately, if you're when you're publishing a book, if you're using any material that is not yours, um, you are obtaining permissions for it the same way you would if you were writing a review article, where you go on the page of whatever article you're citing from, you click on the place that says permissions, you you detail how you're doing that, and then you also cite once you have the permissions in your manuscript, whether it's a journal manuscript or a book manuscript, where that figure came from, where that information came from. So, you know, that's kind of very, is the same across journals and books and make sure that other people's IP and so on is respected. Um, a lot of the publishing model works with uh, assigning copyright to the publisher so that we can actively um, uh, license it everywhere in the world and make sure it shows up everywhere. So that's part of how that happens is the copyright being given to us for, for a chapter and so on. And that's the same for other publishers as well. Uh, we are working on open access, obviously. There are a lot of journals now that are open access. I think every single Elsevier journal right now if not every single one, almost every single one has an open access option. We also have open access um, journals that are completely just open access as well. The way open access often works, if anyone's done it, is that the person submitting will pay a fee at the beginning because 
the permissions fees later on need to be balanced out so that the business model kind of works that way. So there are, there are a lot of different ways that IP comes into play with things, whether it's respecting somebody else's or for your own as well. And we have different options so that people can feel happy with however they end up publishing their book. And they each come with different pros and cons that people will have to weigh themselves to publish. So for example, I remember my paper from grad school, my supervisor at the time, this was years ago where open access wasn't as ubiquitous now, um, paid the extra fee to make it open access um, because I remember his idea was, well, it'll be cited more, et cetera, et cetera. So there's that trade-off that people have to make for themselves of, of what they want to do and what they want to achieve. And I think that's very different depending on um, what your work is and what your uh, goals are for that. So I hope that kind of asks the question. The point is there are different options uh, that can be accommodated and uh, people can inquire about it for their given situation. We have a whole department as well. Um, and we can uh, address any questions there, you know, in more detail even this. Um, let me just add one point here. Um, so if, if I'm um, just to uh, further elaborate, elaborate on a specific point. If I'm an author and somebody is using my ideas against my, uh, without permission. So the thing is that's plagiarism. The entire scientific community has very strict policy towards those who commit plagiarism. Uh, they are outcasts, their academic careers tumble, they get retractions, checked into their papers published for 20 and 30 years ago, it, it is an end of career where, when, when an author is actually has, has committed uh, plagiarism. But there is also that other part, if you're talking about book publishing, there's also that other part that comes with the commercial rights. Uh, if I'm personally gaining a commercial benefit from stealing somebody else's work, this makes things much more worse because this is where you can legal. actually take very strong legal actions. Yes, as well right. and and it is the publisher that actually helps protect those kind of uh um, those kind of rights as well it's a great question i mean we've had not me myself but i know we have had books at elsevier where in the production process so before the book is published we do use systems that look at uh, plagiarism for example even from the authors that write our books and we have caught plagiarism and had to cancel books that way so that does happen um, you know even from our perspective and we have safeguards to try to make sure that doesn't happen in any way we sometimes will find a link to a book of ours online for free and those get reported our legal team works to act on that because just like Khalid said there's uh, commercial benefits that are gained by other people by putting that up. And, and we want to protect our authors because they worked on this book. And if someone's getting their book, our authors should benefit from it, from their own work and so on. So there is a lot that kind of goes into it. Um, and we take it very seriously, both from the perspective of afterwards, during as well. And I know in journals as well, as, as uh, you all know, there have been retractions. People's careers often don't recover from those kind of things. And, and that's something that, you know, we have to look at at all fronts um, and is now with the internet too, obviously, you know, it's easier to access all those things. So it's easier to plagiarize, but it's also easier to catch because we can also find all those other resources that someone is plagiarizing from. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. You could spend a whole session on it. I think talking about the different things. I should maybe do a session right? on it. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and to answer the last question that um, some people have been asking, in the next slide, I'm going to show you the information so you can download the certificate. And on Thank the you. chat, I'm going to send it to everybody. So you should see it. Uh, please enter the link and you will be able to, after you sign in on the top left corner where your name shows up, you will be able to add the workshop code. And um, if you would like to answer the survey, we would appreciate your um, feedback. Excellent. Thank you, Melita. Great. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, from, from our side. Uh, I think if there's anything else from, from the panelists, please uh, feel free to, if you want to uh, close the meeting or...
Thank you very much, uh, our dear speakers, Natalie and Sunini. We all enjoyed uh, the webinar tonight. Very informative, very rich, and thank you very much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Uh, thank you, um, Milita. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Khaled. Uh, I would like to hear from Professor Hisham. He would like to give us any comments before ending the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zahra. Actually, it was an honor for me for being here today with you. Actually, uh, Elsevier touched it, as I say, from, from the front at the beginning, a very critical issue and very important to give more knowledge about the people for SDG. And But after I hear your presentation, actually, I like it too much. I enjoy, even though people think I feel sleepy now because of it's almost 1.44 <laughs> Malaysian times in the morning. But you touched a very, very important subject for all researchers. Most of the researchers nowadays love to just write the papers and review, forgot highly cited, and they forgot about writing a book and a book chapter. And, but for now in this era for SDG, this is very crucial to having a book. Uh, me and myself, I'm, I, I wrote a book for Elsevier. I edited the book for Elsevier. And also I was examiner for book for Elsevier and wrote a book chapter for you as well and many publishers. I think now to be visible in national level and to help your country and society, you need to think about the book. Why? Because the policy maker, decision maker, you don't, they don't read their papers or a review article. They need to have a book comprehensive in a topic, then they give them a good direction for as a developmental plan for their nation. Then we, we as a researchers, if you focusing writing a book and a book chapters, which is going to be accessible to our policymaker and to accessible to decision makers and also in the business society, because also I work in the business companies and usually they need to have something comprehensive. They cannot go after one paper or other paper. They need something like a book. Therefore, I think your uh, seminar today it's very, very helpful for the researcher to change a little bit the mindset, to give them uh, emphasis how important is the book for us as a researchers to not only uh, help ourselves to, to be known among scientific society, but also to be contribute to contribute more in the national development plan for our countries. And with this, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hisham El Anshasi, Director of Institute of Bioproduct Development at the University of Technology in Malaysia for being uh, our panelists tonight. And uh, we are sorry for making you uh, staying up that late, but we enjoyed uh, your presence with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'd like to Very thank uh, everyone here tonight, and um, uh, I hope our audience enjoyed the webinar just as we all did. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for being part of our event. Uh, regarding the certificates, like uh, Melita uh, explained, you can uh, go through the website or the platform from Elsevier, and also from the conference unit at the National Research Center, you'll be uh, receiving a certificate on the email you, re you registered with uh, for attending tonight uh, within a couple of days. So please check your emails, please um, take the survey for Elsevier and uh, you will also receive a PDF version of the presentation for tonight. Thank you very much for our speakers, uh, Natalie and uh, Sunini, uh, acquisition editors at Elsevier. Thank you for Dino Venturino, Elsevier Reference Solutions Sales Manager. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Khaled uh, Shalin, uh, area manager at uh, Egypt and Northeast Africa. And I would like to thank Walid, maybe he's not here now, but I would like to thank Walid for being uh, here from the side of the AKB. Uh, and I would like to thank again, um, hope I'm not forgetting anyone. <laughs> Melita Perez, thank you very much, uh, customer consultant for the Elma M Latin. Uh, I would like to thank our technical support at the conference unit at the National Research Center. That was Dr. Zahra Ahmad El Moifi, assistant researcher at the Child Health Department of the Medical Research Division of the National Research Center in Egypt. Uh, I would um, strongly advise you to follow us on the Facebook page of the conference unit and the website for.
for the conference unit. Um, we will be having, maybe this is an opportunity for me to invite everyone to uh, register for our second international conference at the National Research Center. And it's also within the same scope of uh, science and sustainable development. Uh, it will be an online virtual event on uh, October 25th to 27th. So uh, please visit the website for the conference, uh, icssd2021.com. We will be writing it down on the chat box. Uh, thank you for all the questions and thank you for all the answers and thank you for all the time we spent together all through the world. So I uh, hope you will be having a nice rest of your day and nice, uh, what remains of your night on the other side of the globe. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Stay safe and see you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank have you. a great day to go. Bye. <laughs>